now I would like to ask uh, Jake if he is here or he maybe just stepped out to come and welcome us to the place here at Kairos. Yeah, uh, at fault. Grace Presbyterian. That's my fault. That's not really good. <laughs> Should I just step in? Sure, sure. Um, do you think Jake will be a little while? Yeah, he'll be right here. Oh, okay. Um, for those of you who are online, I'll just say we can, you can probably see most of us, but I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like 15 people, and there's more of us milling around. So there's like 15 people here in person at Grace Presbyterian Church. Um, and for those, and if you can't see the whole group online, Shannon, do you know, can you tell us how many people are online right now? We okay. are 16 screens. So including you, so it's 15 people online, maybe 14. So we are a little community already beginning to form. Jake, mm -hmm. thanks for having us here. Yeah, so hi everybody, uh, I'm Jake. I'm one of the ministers here at Grace and it's great to welcome you into our space. As a community, we value belonging, community, compassion, engagement, and service. And so it's really great to have you here. A couple of things for you, uh, I, I get to kind of do the uh, flight attendant spiel for you. So uh, in the case of an emergency, the nearest exit is over here and then just head out the doors into the parking lot. And uh, there are two washrooms. Uh, so if you head out these doors, uh, you can either go to the end of the hallway and there's a washroom there, or if you take a right and then another right, there's a little alcove and right in that little alcove, there's the other washroom. So uh, it's great to have you here and welcome. Uh, glad glad to uh, be a part of this and to uh, welcome you into Grace of Space. And now, <laughs> yes, Sarah, I'd like to invite Sarah. Um, Sarah's going to open our morning for us. Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Arthurs, and um, I'd like to thank Grace for welcoming us with your open arms, literally, so lovely. And uh, Kevin, thank you for nudging all of us Calgarians. He's very good at that. Let me just tell you, he's a very good nudger. It's because of his nudging that, uh, that we are here. So thank you so much, Kevin, for doing that. Um, I want to give you a little overview of the morning, just so you kind of know where we're going. Um, I'm going to say a few words by way of um, introducing myself, why I'm here, um, some of the work of an, uh, an event, uh, a project called Green Exodus. Um, we will be welcomed to this place and this land with our colleague and friend, Tony Snow, and really glad for that grounding in the earth, which is even more important because of the theme of what we're attending to today. So, so glad to be having that. Um, and then it's been my pleasure to kind of um, uh, bring into our community together a number of people that I've been working with over the last two years and who I've grown to know some more than others, but who've become aware of the amazing things that are happening in Calgary. So we will be hearing from um, my friend and colleague, Liz Reese, who will be speaking about the mystic contemplative path and why it offers hope and wisdom in our times. Um, Robin Hope Gailey will be speaking about her experience and her offerings around Wild Church, a grassroots movement inviting connection with creation. Um, Dave Soddy, who is not here yet, will be speak he's from the Lutheran world, will be speaking about what do you pack for the journey into hope. And Doreen Cott, who I'm sure is known to everybody here, um, will be sharing her experience from Parkdale United Church about how to create an energy efficient church building. And then at the end, there'll be a chance for some integrating of what we've, um, all these different pieces that we've touched into. And all of them will be kind of giving us an experience and um, another uh, um, kind of perspective on what, what is hope. Um, in this time of climate crisis. So I wanted to just share why I am here today. Um, yes, a little bit. Um, I'm here because in November of 20, uh, 2019, I experienced a kind of profound permeability and unsettling around climate change. 
it wasn't on my agenda to be particularly concerned and some things happened to change that. Since then, I've been on a journey of learning, praying, experimenting, of gathering with others to explore what God, life, love, the Holy Spirit is calling us forward into as the biosphere we know shifts and fragments. This journey has acquired the name of Green Exodus. And as we know, the Exodus in the Old Testament began with the burning bush. And I remember reading in a meditation by Richard Rohr, which I went back to try to find and couldn't find, um, an occasion where he made the provocative um, statement that perhaps the burning bush was maybe like our fall leaves, you know, in autumn when they are brilliant yellow and gold. So not something kind of freaky like green leaves and fire around them, but something very natural, but for some reason, astoundingly beautiful to Moses at that moment in time. So much so that it made him stop. It made him say, wow. And it made him permeable to God's call and invitation to something different. Now, I don't know whether that sits with you or not, but it's an interesting perspective to open up our minds about how God is present to us in the earth. So what I would like you to do, and this is the invitation for people online as well, is by way of beginning, I'd like you to just get into little clusters of three or four, and I'd like you will take about five minutes. And what I'd like you to do is um, to think about in this lineage of being upended by the astonishingness of the earth. I wrote that line, I had to say it. Upended by the astonishingness of the earth. Um, I would like you to think about some occasion lately where you have been just wowed by wildness, by something green and living, some four-footed or winged creature that has totally caught your attention and initiated delight within you. And I'd like you to get together with like three or four other people and introduce yourself and just share that particular moment in time. It could be this morning when you saw the sky, pink and blue and white and gorgeous, or it could be the incredible autumn we've had a particular moment when the leaves fell down on your head like blessing. Just invite you to think about that and then just share it. So we'll take about five minutes to do that. And um, and then we'll we'll reconvene. Um, so one of the activities that um, Green Exodus did in 2021 was we hosted a month of activities we called Earth Jam, community and um, practice spiritual practices for living in a time of emergency, emergence, emergency, and. Um, at that event, we were given the, at the opening ceremony for that event, we were each given the opportunity to think about what our intention was for this month of kind of significant engagement and programming. And what came to me was that I wanted to move forward without a map. I wanted to move forward without a map. And I thought, that's obtuse. <laughs> What I wasn't expecting that, um, didn't, I didn't know what it meant. So the following weekend, I took some time for reflection and possible meanings emerged, which felt validating and encouraging. So as I was wondering, what is a journey without a map? I had this BGO. Does anybody know what a BGO is? No? It's a blinding glimpse of the obvious. A BGO, okay. So I had a BGO. And that moving forward without a map is an exodus. So in the exodus, the Israelites left Egypt without a predetermined destination and without a map. The le they left because they had to, or they would die. Guidance and sustenance were provided by God on a moment to moment, day to day, need to know basis. They were acutely and uncomfortably dependent which on a number of occasions was more than they could tolerate. You think of the, the, the time of the golden calf. They just couldn't, couldn't handle the ambiguity of the situation. But they were walked into a new relationship with God, who we might say the divine, the more than us, who calls us into life and love, and into a new relationship with the land and with each other. And eventually they got to a destination. 
The second BGO that happened for me um, around Exodus was that Exodus is a community journey. An Exodus is not a solitary journey. It is not a private personal pilgrimage, no single servings, but the journey of a community. All of this carries some weight because the name for me of what we're doing is Green Exodus. So there's a sense of it being a community. So who is on this Green Exodus? Perhaps those of us who have left or are leaving old ways of knowing the earth, old ways of being in the earth, old ways of knowing and naming God, old ways of being church. And perhaps those who are on this exodus are those of us who are seeking a way of being in the earth, which bows within its astounding beauty and honors it as everything necessary to our existence and as the very presence of God in which we live, and move and have our being. Those of us who are seeking a way of living in the earth, which blesses our neighborhoods, all things living and beautiful. Perhaps it's those of us who are opening our hearts and bodies and imaginations and mind to a God who is always beyond words, but never absent. And who is always calling us forward into a new relationship with her, the earth and each other. And perhaps that is what this event is about. We are here finding each other as companions on this exodus together. And uh, we are in this work together of finding new ways of being in the earth. So that is part of my imagining of what the gift of this day is for us, is that we are finding ourselves, finding one another, and finding the spirit of God within us as we are on this exodus into a new way of being in the earth, a way which makes sense of its gorgeousness. So um, having said that, um, I would like now to, um, to pass it over to Kevin, who is going to welcome Tony, who is going to welcome us to this place. Tony, thank you for coming to be here. Um, mm -hmm. I want to ask you to um, teach us what is on your heart, what's in your mind, uh, share with us. We are so grateful for what you have already done. And um, on behalf of Paris Spirit North, we want to just offer you this tobacco, um, this medicine for your healing, for our healing, for the healing of the earth. Thank you for the invitation to uh, come to this. Uh, having talked early on with Kevin about how this could come together and some of the coordinating we did a couple months ago to think about where this gathering resides and thinking about the connection between now and uh, in the coming weeks, the uh, next uh, COP27, the UN, uh, it's a time of bringing ourselves into the open, as, as Sarah was talking about with the Exodus. The other thing we have to remember about Exodus is that it's generational and that this is change. And in our work, a lot of it is trying to find those threads of change that are connected to our past and connected to our wisdom that helps us in times of crisis, helps us in times of unknowing. And so when we come together uh, in our traditional way, we have a smudge and we have a time of prayer. And that is uh, one of the traditions of our elders that they take part in as a communion with God, and a remembrance that we are God's children. So I light this candle as a reminder of our uh, connection to our past, our connection to what has gone on in our communities and the struggles that we find today that are connected to our way of being. And all of those things resound in our efforts to find new ways to be together. As we uh, offer this prayer, we burn the smudge, which is a gathering of plants and herbs 
from the mountains. It is a gathering of medicinal plants that we use in healing. And in our traditions, we talk about purification. And in scientific study, we hear how the smoke of the, the sage and other plants that we use actually cleanse the environment. And so there's a deep connection between our understanding, the science around it, and our connection to these faithful practices and how we are in the world. At this time, we hear a lot about Native wisdom being a doorway, a gateway into uh, a greater climate awareness, greater climate knowledge, and how to be with the earth. And a lot of that has to do with our traditions. So that begins with prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, Mother of all, heart of all creation. We know and see you in everything around us. We know your spirit abides with all and that you nurture us into this space that we might learn to live in harmony and oneness with your creation. Forgive us where we have failed with that. Forgive us where we have not lived up to our expectations of caring for the earth, of nurturing one another. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for understanding. We pray for hope that our future the future of our children and their children might extend long past our current trajectory. As we gather at this time, we remember our Mother Earth, Makoche. We remember that our time here is not long, but that in our work, we can carry on the stewardship that our ancestors have done teach that to one another, that we learn to live in harmony and in balance with the world around us. Jesus Christ, Going to uh, put up on the screen here a Land written a uh, uh, land acknowledgement for the uh, Calgary Climate Hub, and this is sort of a rendition of that uh, that came out a little earlier than that. And this is because we're coming from different spaces, because we're coming from different areas, you can also add your uh, area that you're coming from uh, in the chat. And Part of this is a recognition of how we are grounded and how we are centered in this land, how we are here and how we came to be here. And in that, we are talking about relationships. We're talking about history. We're talking about that process of being together. So our acknowledgement today bridges lands and territories among the whole of creation. In this sacred space, we remember the lands to which we were first called into being, ancestral lands, holy lands, full of belonging and nurture, lands that spoke our language back to us, whose names we recognize in our ancestral tongues and to whom we were recognized and known by our places of origin. This was the first reconciliation, knowing belonging and acceptance by all God's creatures and all God's creation. In this relationship, we learned about God, our creator through the works of creation and we learned our purpose by observing the inner workings of ecosystems and the lives of our cohabitants the animals the plants the rivers the stars in each their own way follow, follow god's plan <laughs> with the coming of the christian teachings our and instruction our lessons that were given by creator were misinterpreted condemned and embraced and we were forced to assimilate now, generations later, we work to rebuild our communities, the beautiful stories they preserve to use in the land. I don't like screens. <laughs> Let's 
but if you want to make it bigger, I'm going to find the uh, sledger. Yeah, right at the bottom, there's a little thing that will decide that. Oh, yeah, that's, that's correct. So, um, with this, uh, we have in our tradition that as morally, uh, we came to Christianity in the 1850s, uh, 1840s with Rundle, uh, Reverend Robert Rundle, who came out to our reserve uh, and was a minister there. He uh, had sort of an open way around his involvement and taught many stories in Cree to our people. Our people are Stony. And in the uh, connection there, it became deepened by a Anishinaabe uh, missionary who came to our reserve and was a very gifted man who taught us to accept the Bible as a guide, not as a instruction that was uh, imposed upon us. We're very different from many tribes that we embraced the teachings of Christianity and of Jesus, and that those were incorporated into our customs, in our culture, in our ceremonies, and all of that has a, a resonance for our people. They did things like uh, create their own longer prayers and hymns that were used in a Christian tradition, and we use those, those prayers and ideas in our uh, ceremonies around death, around life, around uh, some of our work with the church and some of our customary times, like when you come of age. Here, a poem, a uh, 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 traditional uh, stony hymn called God Father. I'm just going to sing that for us. A day waka Nibi Mahakuno Was Tia in a Hechano In this work, we are often brought to connection with others. And so uh, in my father's time, he studied at the Cook Christian Training School in Tempe, Arizona. It was run by this Reverend, doc, uh, Dr. Reverend Cecil Corbett from the Nez Pierce tribe in uh, Washington. I had known him for a number of years and I talked to him last year. Uh, he was concerned about being in uh, Arizona I wanted to go up and see his daughter uh, in, back home and had decided to make that trip. And we had a conversation before that he made that trip and then got sick from COVID and died. Uh, but this is one of his, his uh, uh, prayers from the book of Reformed Prayers. Gratitude for creation. Creator God, your presence is as the wind, the breath, and sustainer of life. We are grateful for being a part of your beautiful creation. Rugged mountains, rolling plains, uncultivated deserts. We thank you for the birds of the air, the animals, the fish of the sea, for purity of air and water and healing medicines that remind of the need for holy virtue in life, spiritual and physical. In your holy mystery, you have revealed that we are God's children wonderful mosaic of humanity with different cultures and heritages. We have work yet to do to work for truth and equity. We pray that we might always be found faithful, reflecting your love. Cause 
light to overcome the darkness in this world. Be present, O oh God, through your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. In this work, and as we find our center and our place within this land, it is a recalling to our body, to our spirit of belonging and of knowing us in this space. When we think about this, I'm reading from Acts 17, uh, verses 24 to 26 from the First Nation version of the New Testament. It says, the great spirit is the one who created the universe and all things in it. He is the rightful ruler of the spirit world above and the earth below. He does not live in lodges built by human hands. The creator does not really need human beings to do things for him, since he is the one who gives all people life and breath and everything we need. Beginning with the first human being, he made all nations and tribes and wanted people to live all over the face of the earth. He decided ahead of time when and where each tribe would live. So this idea of placeness and intention. My father writes, for thousands of years, the Stony people gained an education from the tribal leaders which fitted them to live with pride and confidence on this great island. They learned the ways of the seasons, the ways of the animals and birds. They learned which plants and herbs would sustain their good health. They learned the ways of living together, respect for the needs of others, the sharing of the bounty of the hunt, and the meaning of prayer. They learned to live in all the seasons. They learned the importance of bravery and wisdom. They learned the responsibility of leadership. They did not build schools as a white man does but the stony education system was suited to the requirements of a free and independent people living in a free land. In this notion of belonging, there is a way of determining our presence by this investiture of our being into these spaces and of our stewardship and connection to the land, doing what we are responsible for. My father writes, in the days prior to the coming of the white man who lived a nomadic way of life, hunting, fishing, gathering the abundance of the good land, there were literally millions of buffalo roaming the western plains along the foothills and even in the Rocky Mountains themselves. Mm -hmm. There were game, game animals of all kinds, moose, elk, deer, wild sheep and goats, readily available for us to hunt and to enjoy. The land was vast, beautiful and rich in abundant resources. Our mother earth called from us called us from the mountains and prairies, the valleys and mountain areas, lakes, rivers and springs. Come, my children, anyone who is hungry, come and eat from the fruits and gather from the abundance of this land. Come, everyone who thirsts, come, everyone, come and drink pure spring waters that are especially provided for you. Everywhere the spirits of all, of all living things are alive. We talk to the rocks, the streams, the trees, the plants, the herbs, in all nature's creation, we called the animals our brothers. They understood our language, we too understood theirs. Sometimes they talked to us in dreams and visions. At times they revealed important events or visited us on our vision quests of mountain rocks. Truly we were part of and related to the universe. And these animals were a very special part of the great spirit's creation. In Job we read, but ask the beasts, and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens, and they will tell you. The bushes of the earth, and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all of these does not know the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand and in the life of every living thing and all the breath of all mankind. And so this deep connection with the world that we are embedded in and some relationship with that, knowing that we can turn to creation in our need, and knowing that in our relationships, we must build up that understanding between us and the world around us. And so this sense of being, the sense of belonging, a sense of understanding. My father writes, in our migrations and as in our vision quest, my people continue to observe the lands, plant, the animals, plants, rocks, trees, streams, sun, wind, moon, and stars, and all things. Our teaching has always been that everything was created for a purpose by the great spirit. We must therefore respect all things of creation and learn as much as we can. 
there are less lessons hidden in creation that we must learn in order to live a good life and walk the straight path. In our tradition, uh, this mountain that I have here is the sacred mountain of our people, located just outside our reserve called Mount Yamnaska. Um, Yamnaska is the, the way that we, we say it. And it means like a, a sheer cliff tabletop. And it is a reminder of uh, that this is the place where God sits in our land. Uh, Yamnaska is a funny word because uh, Yamnaska in our language just means messy hair. <laughs> so that's what that's what we're calling it. And um, in this space, we don't climb it retro. I, I've mentioned this before in another of our Green Nexus uh, events. We don't climb the mountain recreational. We don't go there uh, to just hang out. Uh, it, it, we are driven by purpose and by prayer into this land and to share with uh, communion with God at these spaces and to open ourselves up to the message and the spirit of that place in order to receive instruction and uh, education from the land, from creation and from creator is our place to commune with God much like we see in the Hebrew Bible around uh, Mount Zion, Mount Hebron, but these places that are holy in our land. Similarly, we have connection, deep connection to uh, special places that are full of spirit. And when we go into these places, we don't create that. We don't consecrate places and, and make them holy. They are holy unto themselves. And we, as we recognize and engage with those lands, we become, we understand more about our place in that relationship. And so here at Bene Wanka, uh, Mene means water, Waka means spirit. It is a holy lake. It is a place where a spirit resides, where we go and pray. We have been, uh, numerous examples of this in our land. And one of those is uh, the stony connection to uh, Lac St. Anne, which is also another spirit lake. Uh, we call this uh, Lake Ine Wankan, and Lac St. Anne is called Wankamini. And so in these uh, spaces, they are a recognition that God has placed something special and powerful in these areas, and that we go there for instruction, for rejuvenation and connection. We also see there are healing waters there with the hot springs. Those were used medicinally by our people. Uh, one of that example is uh, or Iarhe Abarbin, which is the traditional healing place that is now called Cave and Basin. So when this was discovered, uh, it was immediately cordoned off and turned into Canada's first national park in 1883. And we were forbidden to go there uh, since that time. It was turned into a, a resort, there's a big pool there, um, uh, other uh, facilities and amenities put in there and then kind of caved off the, the or closed off where the cave is and then charging people to go in. It is only since 2010 that we uh, can go back into that space without having to pay the fee uh, to go in, but still it's trying to go into your church when you have tourists and everybody sort of gathered around and, and gawking at what you're doing and you're not really there, you can't really uh, do a smudge or, or do any kind of ceremony there without sort of everyone being in your space. So it's not a private area anymore. I'm going to end off with this, which is this idea of enculturating and of moving within culture into that sense of being, bringing who we are and who we have become connected in community into this space of understanding. So in Beloved Amazonia, uh, a uh, document that I went through in uh, one of the uh, uh, Mennonite uh, programs, uh, I came across this particular passage, which I think really, to me, kind of woke me up to what we have been missing for a long time. 
So it says, in the Eucharist, God, in the combination of the mystery of the incarnation, chose to reach our inner depths to the fragment of matter. The Eucharist joins heaven and earth. It embraces and penetrates all creation. For this reason, it can be a motivation for our concerns for the environment, directing us to be stewards of all creation. In this sense, encountering God does not mean fleeing from the world or turning our back on nature. It means that we can take up the liturgy, many elements proper to the experience of indigenous people in their contact with nature and respect native forms of expression in song, dance, rituals, gestures, and symbols. The Second Vatican Council called for this effort to enculturate the liturgy among the indigenous people. And over 50 years have passed, and we have still have far to go, to go along these lines. So in 1950, this was called for, and through our uh, either belligerents or um, knowing better, we didn't bother to take this opportunity to open this door and to walk through and see where we would end up. I think we'd be in a very different space if we had sort of learned from one another. I'm just going to read from uh, one last passage from Joy Harjo from her poem, The Exile of Memory. The old Muscogee, Muscogee laws outlaw the Christian religion because it divided people who are relatives a panther, raccoon, deer, and other animals, and lived, and winds were soon divided. But Muscogee ways are to make relatives. We made a relative of Jesus, gave him a Muscogee name. We cannot see our ancestors as we climb up the ridge of destruction, but from the bark we sense their soft presences at the edges of our minds. We hear their singing. There is no word in this trade language. No words with enough power to hold all these, all this we have become. We are in time. There is no time. For me, when I hear this, it is how we have built that inculturation of what we have encountered. We have taken on Christianity and its teachings to find a balance between our understanding around us. And this is a common pattern for Indigenous people, even through a lot of the uh, assimilation and, and forced measures that we still find time and still find ways to keep our traditions alive, to keep our understanding alive. And Christianity is not our one whole form. It is part of how we understand the world. It is one aspect of the world that we can learn from and that we move through continue on knowing who we are, knowing how we are in the world, that we can flourish in a way that God intended bringing us new information. Every, uh, I often say every missionary, every explorer that came through our land was greeted um, and learned from and was taken through the mountain passes in our, in our traditional land and let free on the other side, guided and nurtured and loved in that way and that we always welcome the stranger. We always had that practice. And so we continue to do that. And I continue to do that here with all those who are strangers now uh, who can learn and who can share in this wisdom, share in this understanding. That we I'll turn it back over to you and, and whoever's next for <laughs> Many of us have learned the kind of tradition of kind of a bow during our days of pandemic and online and just want to say thank you, Tony, for the goodness and the breadth of those, wor those words. And I felt the mountains come into our space. I felt the rivers. I felt the wind. I felt the trees. I felt the lineage that we're being welcomed into. Um, I'm just, yeah, thank you so much, Tony. All right. Um, so the next piece on our um, that we wanted to spend some time with is what I'm calling um, a practice of community. And um, this is something that we've also been experimenting with through um, Green Exodus. And this is a way of being together, which creates a space 
for us to speak what is most alive in us right now and to hear what is most alive for other people. So the structure of how we gather and um, is that we will get into groups of three and um, you will each have three minutes to speak. No one can interrupt you. The people who are listening, their role is to be very present, to try not to relate, try not to make connections, try not to think about how you can fix or solve whatever the person might be sharing. But just by your attention and your presence, create a container where they can articulate something that comes from perhaps something surprising for them. And part of how I see this connected to our Christian tradition and to hope is that as Tony has been articulating, we believe that God is present in each of us. And we also come from a Trinitarian faith, which sees God as three and that life and love and creativity flows between three somehow. It's a complex theology. But there is this belief that God is between us and amongst us. And when we gather and when we are present in who we are and we join with others who are equally able to be present, something new is born, some new energy, some new love, some new understanding, some new possibility. So we're gonna experiment with this today. And what this will look like is that you will find two other people um, and online, Shannon will break um, people into breakout rooms. You will each take your phone, if you have one, and somebody will go first. And the question you have is, why are you here today? And I invite you to sink into that question. Don't just go, well, you know, who's my job? Or, <laughs> you know, um, but really, given the goodness of what we've already experienced, let that nurture your answer to this question. Okay, why are you here today? What has brought you to this space with these strangers about the earth, about climate change? What brings you here today? And you'll have three minutes to speak to that. And if you don't fill the whole time, don't worry about it. If you need silence at any point in your three minutes, just take it. The other people won't interrupt you. And when the little wonderful little kind of alarm thing on your phone goes off, then it'll move to the next person. And there doesn't need to be any crosstalk, no conversation. It's just you have three minutes and then you provide listening for the other two people in your small group. And then we'll come back together and we'll just hear a little bit of what surfaced, what's come out from that. And um, so that's what we'll do with our next um, time together. Any questions about that? And this will feel uncomfortable, perhaps. Something new, something maybe on the edge of your comfort zone. But we're on an exodus. An exodus is going somewhere new. So I invite you to embrace this opportunity as a chance to experiment with that. And know there's no right or wrong way to do it. Just take it as, a, as an opportunity for something different. Shannon, how does that sound to you? Any questions or wonderings from your group or from you? I think that's good. Good. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we'll, uh, yeah, we'll take some time. You can find two other people and then somebody can offer to go first and, um, and the first person can set their timer or if someone else has a phone, they can do it for them. So uh, we'll just take a few moments to just hear a little spattering of what emerged um, for you from that experience. Um, and we'll maybe also, is there a way to get some words from the online folks? Yep, I okay. think we just ask and they can. Yes. Okay, all right, well, we'll, maybe we'll start with the people here. Um, so what caught your, I don't want a feedback report. I don't want to kind of know kind of who said what, I, but more, <laughs> But more kind of what caught your attention? What surprised you from that experience? What what got you? What kind of, yeah, what, what caught your attention um, and surprised you from that experience with each other? Now I've told you you can't say verbatim what happened. Nobody is able to say. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Pardon? 
sorrow. Sorrow was a theme. Thank you. Thank you. Connection was a theme in the face of what we're all facing. Our need to come together was a theme. Okay. That sense of meeting one another, mm -hmm. wanting to be with each other. Cool. Anything, anything else that caught your attention? Yes, we're all trying to help our small ways. And it may only be a small amount, but together we need each other. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, what about from online? Anything that kind of caught their attention or <laughs> sorry, you yeah, have looking at you. I don't know who where, where are you? Okay. Um, anything that Some struck go ahead, sorry. Some things came up in the chat already, and feel free folks to write more or to speak out, but Laura says, we did not know why we're here, but we found that we are seeking. Wonderful. Thank you. And Thank you. Sean says, connection and integration. And actually, it was that we found what we were seeking, even though we didn't know what that was. Thanks, Laura. I misread. Cool. Already. That's amazing. <laughs> we can go home now. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments or statements from the from our online friends? No, is that good? I think in our group we were feeling urgency. Thank you. So thank you for um, being courageous in that moment and perhaps um, making some new choices and. Uh, I am um, glad now to kind of move into the next um, part of our time together and really glad to welcome Liz Reese, who will be kind of um, sharing with us the wisdom and the excitement and passion she has about the mystic, mystic contemplation path as a way forward with all of this newness that we're stepping into. Hi, everyone. So wonderful to be here, uh, connecting with, with all of you online and here in person. I thought I want to talk about um, yeah, contemplative and mystic things. And I thought it would be really lovely for us to just at this moment sit in a couple of minutes of silence. Would you be okay with that? We've uh, been taking in a lot and um, it'll, it'll be a time for us to just ground and then and then I'm going to uh, stand up after a couple of minutes and uh, launch us into what I want to say with that with a Meister Eckhart uh, poem. So I invite you now to um, just close your eyes. And just see if you can relax into your physical form. The sense of coming home to the body. Letting yourself unclench in every way. Dropping your shoulders a little bit and clenching the jaw. Coming with great kindness to our deepest home in the heart. residing in the center of our being and taking a moment there just to connect. Connect with the divine indwelling. Connect with the deep inside of you.
connect with everyone here, be it in person or online, where we are gathered together. So from that place of heart, listen to what Meister Eckhart wrote in the 14th century. When I was the stream, when I was the forest, when I was still the field, when I was every hoof, foot, fin, and wing, when I was the sky itself. No one ever asked me, did I have a purpose? No one ever wondered, was there anything I might need? For there was nothing I could not love. It was when I left all we once were that the agony began. The fear and questions came, and I wept. I wept. And tears I had never known before. So I returned to the river. I returned to the mountains. I asked for their hand in marriage again. I begged. I begged to wed every object and creature. And when they accepted, God was ever present in my arms. And God did not say, where have you been? For then I knew my soul, every soul, has always held the sacred. So Meister Eckhart, wonderful mystic of the Christian tradition, um, often um, brought forth when we're talking about creation spirituality. So uh, deep ecology educator Joanna Macy has said that in our time of crisis, there are three things to focus on. And different people are going to play different parts. One is holding action. And holding action is about protecting the earth with protests and activism and political organizing. And the second is life-sustaining actions, which is creating new life, perhaps as in the shells of old containers. Maybe this is uh, permaculture, community gardening, or different ways of doing things. <laughs> and the third is consciousness shifting actions, which are about waking up wisdom, helping the spiritual shift take place in our times. So I guess you could say where I'm coming from today is that third category, <laughs> consciousness shifting action. It tends to be where I'm most positioned and inclined. <laughs> but I honor everything everybody's doing. 
So I would like to talk about the, the mystic and contemplative path, which gives me hope in our times. And I think needs to rise up in our times. About how the mystics of the Christian tradition are begging <laughs> to guide us through this dark night of the soul. Mystic teachers like Meister Eckhart, who I just uh, read to you some of his wisdom. These mystics and contemplatives knew something about journeying deep, about, about breaking down the walls of separation, about fierce courage, about traveling through darkness, and about suffering. The wonderful John of the Cross beautifully described that he came to a place where there was no other light to guide than the one that burned in his heart. What is burning in our hearts? What is burning in our hearts at this time of climate crisis? What kind of inner fire do we have to draw on? Good question. <laughs> we can and do, quite rightly, talk about the climate emergency and ecological destruction as being caused by human greed and overconsumption. But every time I hear us going on about that, I keep asking, well, what's causing that? What in us? What's going on in us deeply? We can keep rearranging the pieces and the politics, but something keeps coming up, no matter how we organize externally. <clears throat> So people uh, tend to think of the contemplatives um, as people who are sitting around maybe navel gazing or staring at a candle, or maybe you can go to them for a little stress relief. Actually, it won't take you long if you look to see the contemplatives, the mystics of our own Christian tradition are fierce and bold and courageous and all about transformation. The mystics, for example, coined the phrase, the false self, the ego-driven self that is never satisfied always striving for more, to obtain more, to gain more power, to get more external security, control, endless affection and praise. Our propensity, in other words, to search for happiness outside of ourselves in external conditions. Might that have something to do with overconsumption and greed. And they teach us how to shed the false self, to let it die, in fact, through the, through the wisdom Jesus, through the contemplative path, through the inner journey of silence, emptying, and surrender how to become receptive, guided by spirit, 
wed to every object and creature. Meister Eckhart's words again. Uh, listen to what Thomas Merton, who was writing in the, in the 50s and 60s, had to say. He said, and he's brilliant when he talks about the false self, he says, we are at liberty to be real or to be unreal. We may be true or false, the choice is ours. We may wear now one mask and now another, and never, if we so desire, appear with our own true face. Our own true face. The contemplative hunger in our times, in my view, is palpable. We are hungry for truth for authenticity, for the journey that guides us to that true face. And for the journey that guides us to the light that burns in our heart, that will guide us through our collective dark nights and our, and our personal ones. Might it be, uh, the church itself is going through a death of the false self in our times. So that the true face may appear under the refuse of empire, tired protocol, and being in the head rather than the heart, the burning heart. <laughs> so I am. Um, I've been very honored to teach uh, within the Centering Prayer tradition, which is, a, and I have some people here, we've been journeying together recently um, with that practice. It's a contemplative practice that was originally taught by Thomas Keating, a Trappist monk, and carried forth by mystic teachers such as Cynthia Bergeau and many, many others. The practice is one of silence and surrender. And it is deceptively simple. It is silent receptivity with the holy. It's a practice that teaches us to open, to make room for the guidance of the spirit, to welcome transformation. To welcome transformation within and around us. To welcome the shedding of who we are not. How oh, wonderful. <laughs> welcome the shedding of who we are not. It's the complete opposite of what our culture teaches because it teaches us not to take up any space just to sit and allow what, what God wants to bring up in us. The path of deep humility. People don't rush and sign up for the path of deep humility in our culture. But the world is suffering from our taking up of space, from our endless taking, from our falsity and lack of consciousness, from our alienation from our own deep and sacred hearts. So centering prayer, I believe, is what we need and practices like it what we need on the planet right now. How to learn to listen. <coughs> to make an opening, to head for wisdom. Instead of our scrambled and reactive doing, which we've been <laughs> on this hamster wheel for so long.
So I wanted to give an example um, of how this mystic contemplative path um, meets eco-spirituality. So about a year ago, um, through uh, Sarah mentioned Earth Jam, <laughs> and our um, we did a day during Earth Jam last year, of a full day and evening of of Wild Church, and we did a Wild Church wander, where we were all assigned to head out into nature. We were online when we did this <laughs> due to <laughs> pandemic, but we each were assigned to head out for several hours in our own vicinity or wherever we were drawn to take outside um, the practice of sacred reciprocity. So I went to Fish Creek near where I live and I sat on a log in centering prayer for quite a long time. And then uh, began, I began to move slowly, very, very slowly through a small pathway through the woods. And at a certain point, um, as I was just very slowly and peacefully walking along, at a certain point, uh, a deer appeared in the woods. And she and I held a very long gaze. And every few minutes, because I was in such a, a space of peace and silence, every few minutes, I just took a tiny little step like this toward her and stopped <laughs> and keep, kept holding the gaze with just this deliberate benevolence toward her. And outpouring toward her. And at a certain point, she lay down. And I knew something about the return that my Meister Eckhart was describing. And I knew something about the sacred. Thomas Berry the wonderful geologian said, only the sense of the sacred is gonna save us now. I knew something about the shift of consciousness that Joanna Macy was talking about. And sometimes when I want to put down this work, you know what I see? I see the eyes of that deer. And other, other animals I've had similar opportunities with, I just see their eyes. And I can't um, forget that. So I returned to the river. I returned to the mountains. I asked for their hand in marriage again. I begged. I begged to wed every object and creature. And when they accepted, God was ever present in my heart. So thank you everyone. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> I'm sure we get a chance to talk more. Thank you. So, <clears throat> 
going to take a, a bit of a break now, about 10 minutes. Um, I invite you to words and quiet. So much in there. So, um, but we'll, we'll reconvene at about five to about eight. That works for the folks on Mark Two. Okay, I'll add to. There is there are mufflings, I believe, out, and there's more coffee. So that must be great as well. She was always having this experience and the very first time we had this wedding last year. Yeah. Sorry, we don't have air
Okay. I don't have a Oh, I'm going to start reading. I'm in the program. Okay. I'm in the program. 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 I'm in the energy artist, matter shaper, poetry of the universe, choreography of spinning galaxies and whirling atoms, sculptor of spheres, wild drummer of heartbeat and breath, weaver of wonders, potter of planets, architect of continents, master storyteller of our universe. Dramatist who gives us a heart. Actor with us and within us in the play. We trust and love the spirit of creation whose wild work in progress we are. Beautiful of color in eyes and skin. <clears throat> Curious, adventurous, ever-changing, speaking a thousand languages, dancing a million dances, smiling seven billion smiles, dreaming dream upon dream. We trust and love the spirit of creation who calls creation good. Yes, very, very good. Hallelujah. <laughs> that Wild Earth Litany comes from a presentation that Brian McLaren gave here in Calgary in 2019, just at the outset of my um, time at, in seminary. I'm a seminary student at Vancouver School of Theology. And in that same talk, Brian McLaren called for the rewilding of Christianity, the return to a creation-based uh, way of worshiping outdoors in the natural world where Jesus taught where the cosmos is our witness and guide. If we want to activate hope for a healthier future, I agree with McLaren, we should take church back out, outdoors, whether it's into the public square, as John Wesley did, or into the wilderness, as the Wild Church Network invites us to do. Um, but before I say a bit more about that, I want to give you uh, a minute or two to talk with one other person. So I'll invite you just to turn to somebody different perhaps than you spoke to so far. Um, just one minute each to say, when was the last time, to answer the question, when was the last time that you talked with a member of the larger than human world? And what did you say? Might have been a rock, a mountain, an animal, an insect, a tree, your pet, a bird. One minute each, two people, go. And the uttermost night, and the male and the female, and the plants bursting with seed, and the crowning seasons of the firefly and the apple. I will honor all life, wherever, and in whatever form it may dwell, on earth, my home, and in the mansion of the stars. Thank you. I thought I would just call you all back with words again. <laughs> it's easier, so perhaps easier. Maybe not. I'm sorry if I interrupted people's conversations. Um, I have a basket of stones with me, and I'm going to pass it around. And I realize that I can't pass it to you online, uh, but know that I have a stone in a basket with uh, a, a wish that you should hold it, and perhaps you can create an image of your mind in your mind of uh, of it of a small piece of the earth. Uh, in your hand. So I'll pass those if you want to take one and hold it while I, while I share with you. It's a way of bringing Wild Church into this, uh, you know, what Brian McLaren describes as kind of an antiseptic linear space, right? Um, to me, each of these stones is sacred. Each one carries a message of longevity, 
solidity and slow change. And I think this represents a message of hope. <clears throat> I've heard that rocks even are in a process of transformation, although they change much more slowly than we do. Um, it's possible the stones in this basket, basket, in fact, likely that they carry within them a memory of life on this land dating back many hundreds of years and that they will be solid witnesses to life on this land many generations after we've returned to our elementary forms, light. Yeah, so I invite you to consider with me the sacredness of the stones and take one to hold in your hand or imagine one in your hand. Um, I just, I, uh, I'm gonna roar through a bit of a presentation. I'm a seminary student, so there's a little theology in here. But I wanna say I'm a beginner in this work. I'm, I'm a beginner in this work. And so um, I want to uh, maintain a beginner mind and know that I'm, open to correction and always interested in learning more. Um, so I uh, gave a paper at a uh, conference at my theology school a couple of years ago on the importance of returning to outdoor worship. And there was a couple of big problems that I mentioned in that. So uh, I'm just going to give you three. So in order to activate hope, I think, or in this in this situation, it's, it's good to see, to look in the face of the dark at the same time as we're generating fresh fresh hope in, in the light. So um, first, isolation. By early in the 21st century, social isolation was recognized as a modern plague. While our dominant Western social model encourages us not to need each other, we do. We are relational beings, and Brennan Brown says hardwired for connection. But not only do we need each other, we need creation. Our living earth, which is at every level endlessly undergoing transformation from the individual species to the biosphere, the largest ecosystem, which some of you may have heard described as Gaia or as the living incarnation or body of God. Second, this embeddedness. Now this goes back to what Tony said about embeddedness. Um, theologian Norman Wurzba, who grew up in Lethbridge and is now in the US, describes how modern life is characterized by disembeddedness, meaning that we have gradually become disembedded from the sacred ties of kinship and community with land and In fact, transformed through technology, the natural elements that are sustaining us right now are barely recognizable. Water comes from pipes, waste flows away in them. Heat is released from a metal box which fires on command. Light arrives at the flick of a switch. Food comes in cardboard and cellophane. And uh, cars move us back and forth through the major arteries of our cities. But the true and original source of it all is the natural world. Third, economics. The economics of capitalism are a contributing factor in our divorce from nature. Arguing for a moral economy Christopher Lind, who died some years ago, another Canadian, and who I would encourage you all to, to look up. His book is called um, Rumors, Rumors of a Moral Economy. Beautiful book. He points out how economics have become disembodied from society. The quote, economy, unquote, depersonalizes. It describes humans as labor. Nature as land and capital as money and forces these organic, living, loving uh, beings into, into uh, self-regulating markets that ignore moral and social impact. In this system, labor and land are only seen to have value when they are productively feeding the economy through extraction and exploitation, <coughs> activating hope is what we're here to do though. So those are the problems and I'll stop on the problems. <laughs> Let's get to the optimistic side. Um, I am here because I am um, have the gift of um, helping to plant a wild church community in Calgary um, as a practicum project in my seminary education through Vancouver School of Theology. 
And I'm grateful to the participation of people in this room, including Sarah and Liz um, and Tony, um, who have helped to direct that process so far. Um, a few things on uh, on restoring our right relationship with the earth, which is a goal of, of uh, wild, the Wild Church community. Um, theologian Peter Rollins, who lived through the troubles in Northern Ireland as a child, defines reconciliation as to sit with again. In order to reconcile our relationships, we need to sit alongside those different from ourselves and have a meaningful chat about things, a chat in which we show up, pay attention, tell the truth, and don't become attached to the results. <clears throat> so recovering from our divorce from nature, like the reconciliation process we are working towards in our treaty relationship with our Indigenous relatives, requires a commitment to sit with the land and listen. Wild Church helps us develop or practice that heightened sensory awareness of the sacredness of life and our essential interdependence with it. So Wild Church is a new ministry that can appeal to those who are well-connected in church communities, those who call themselves spiritual but not religious, and those who have no interest in ever entering a church. Our practices are different from traditional church services, and to support participation of those, the participation of those who are attending church, we intentionally choose meeting times that are not in conflict with traditional worship times. Um, the liturgy is different uh, from, uh, you know, typical church liturgy. Our gatherings last 75 to 90 minutes, thereabouts, they could be much longer and some of us would advocate for longer when you're trying to sit in the forest and listen because it takes time. Um, a few of the elements that we do uh, regularly um, from my experience with Wild Church so far is acknowledge the land and water with feeling. Take active uh, prayerful steps to become more mindfully aware and physically present in the moment, uh, call in the directions, and go off for a wild wander, a silent wild wander to listen to what the earth has, has to, to teach us today. Uh, after the wild wander, we come back together to share what we learned in the circle, and uh, perhaps to create a small mandala from various earth objects that people will bring back with them. The goal, uh, of the of Wild Church, according to the Wild Church Network, is a relationship with nature rooted in love, through which we participate in the kindred connection of all beings, elements, and places. The hope is only that participants will develop a deep caring about the more than human world that surrounds us and depends on our living earth alongside us. By practicing embodied presence in nature and learning to be still and listen, we can form caring connections with other life forms. Okay, so I hope I get three more minutes. And I'd like to invite you, all of you, to, uh, to practice a, a two minute meditation practice with me out of the three that I'm asking to have, have uh, still. So we'll spend a few uh, minutes on a, a wild wander of a sort without leaving our chairs, which I know is deeply insufficient. However, it's what we have. So I'll ask you just to mindfully meditate on what hope may be activated through a small bit of earth that's in your hand right now or that you're imagining to be so. Set your feet firmly against the earth. Root your spine down to the chair in which you sit, knowing that the earth is always there. Breathe deeply and slowly. Offer a silent, intentional prayer, asking for guidance from the earth, from the stone. Breathe in deeply and at the top of the breath, feel how it feels for your body to be full. Pause there. 
as you feel the urge and begin to breathe out, feel the space the stone occupies physically or psychically. And at the bottom of the breath, feel how it feels for your body to be empty. Really take note of the pause in your breath. And in that small space of emptiness, allow your fears of not doing this the right way to flow away as your body calls for it. Take another breath in, fully and deeply. Allow images and feelings associated with the earth, with the stone in your hand or in your mind to flow naturally. experience. Thomas Berry says, in reality, there is a single, single integral community of the earth that includes all its component members, whether human or other than human. In this community, every being enters into communion with other beings. Wild Church hopes and intends to support our experience of communion with creation as our prayers are spoken in view of the elemental sources that support our living. If this idea appeals to you, I invite you to, to join us for a future gathering. I'll be uh, helping to support this um, community building effort as a student until April, but the intention is that we're growing a community uh, that will continue well beyond um, my practicum project. And so I invite you to be part of that. Um, or perhaps, perhaps, just make your way outdoors in your own backyard or the park nearby in the coming days. Sit at the base of a tree and say aloud these words from Mary Oliver's iconic poem, Wild Geese. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. What does your tree have to tell you? What, when you feel it's your turn to speak, might you have to tell it? Thank you.